Good morning. Welcome to Ensuring Success 2021. We are so thrilled that you're here with us. We are here in Dallas, Texas, uh, transmitting to you and uh, can't wait for an exciting day of lots of good continuing education with all of the panels we've assembled, experts in the field, every one of them. We can't wait to share all of these great ideas with you. Um, uh, just a brief thank you before we get started with the actual session to our sponsors who are making this event possible. And those sponsors include ADP, CPA Charge, Avalara, Botkeeper, Comply Right, CorePay, CoreV, CPA.com, eFile for Biz, Intuit, QX Global, Right Networks, Safe Send Returns, Ace Cloud Hosting, Sage, Suralink, TaxFile, Vic AI, Walters Kluwer, and Zero. We would not be here if it weren't for them. So we are particularly thank you, thankful to every one of our sponsors. And in this case also, especially thankful to Suralink who is sponsoring this particular session. Um, on your screen, I just wanna point out if you have any questions for our speakers, or any technical questions, any issues at all, you can scroll down right below the video window and there's a button you can click, it says, I think it says ask a question, and just click that and you can submit a question and it will come right to us. Um, we'll have a couple polls during this session just to ask you some general questions about who you are. Those are not the CPE polls. If you are planning on getting CPE credit for this session, the way that works is three times during the session, we will announce that there's a number appearing on the bottom of the screen and you need to write down that number. So you'll collect three three digit numbers during the session and at the end of the day or the end of tomorrow, whenever you're ready to collect your CPE, you'll go to the get CPE option at the top of your screen and enter the numbers that you collected for every session you attended and you can download your certificates automatically from that. So that's how CPE works. Um, I would like right now to introduce our speakers for session one. And this session one is about remote auditing, which is something that a lot of people are facing right now. Um, so our speakers right now next to me is Chris Wood and then Joe Ballantyne and Garrett Wagner. And my co-moderator is Alexander DeFelice, who will be helping uh, field questions and running our polls and uh, also joining us in the conversation. So I'd like each of our speakers first to give you just a brief introduction to who they are. So Chris. Yes, good morning, Gail. Chris Brown, uh, I was in public accounting for almost 12 tax seasons and just left uh, back in March to go to work for one of my clients, which is was a a medical college, so now I am on the client side, so I've seen a little bit of both now. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm Joe Ballantyne. I'm co-founder and vice president of sales at Suralink. So since 2014, I've been helping firms streamline their PVC document process and provide a much better client experience, working with firms of all sizes, and I'm really excited to be on the panel today. Gara Wagner, CPA, CITP, uh, CEO and founder of C3 Evolution Group and Evolve Now. So happy to be back here at Ensuring Success. It's a great event and I look forward to this conversation and other ones over the next two days. Hi, Alexandra DeFelice, Director of Marketing and Business Development for Pain and Fears, a law firm that is the name. Um, back here to help Gail co-moderate many of the sessions former, from my former life with accounting today. All right, thanks everybody. So there's really nothing like a global pandemic to make us all rethink the way we do a lot of our work and auditing is no exception. And when I talk about auditing, I think that really also includes um, compilations, reviews, basically the, the jobs that we always used to do on site and uh, may not necessarily be doing on site anymore. Uh, I started my career at Deloitte and although I was in tax, in order to be licensed at the time I needed to, to put in some time in audit as well. And so I have a very tiny amount of experience myself in the audit field. But I remember the auditors had a file drawer in the office. Each one had a file drawer. And then there was a big work table. And that's where the staff auditors, if they were in the office at all, would camp out. But basically, we're, we were not expected to be in the office. And I think that's sort of the image that people had of auditing um, from the get-go. So, uh, so 
there have been some changes since the pandemic. And what are you guys seeing? I'm going to just start with you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's the largest change of, of going from being out at the client's office, uh, working on client relationships face to face, working with a team face to face, going through audit sections, getting support from the client there in the office. Um, you know, back in the old days of, of paper PBC lists and organizers, and now making that shift to a remote workforce, a remote team where you're on Teams and Slack and 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 all these video conferences, and you're working with your client remotely and asking them for things, which uh, you know. Getting information from the client was hard beforehand, and now you're not in their office where you're annoying them, asking to get the information. Now you're you're, you're sending them uh, electronic things, and so that's obviously the biggest shift of how do we how do we still have the same audit budget, but do it remotely, not around our clients or our staff. Yeah, and one thing I would add is uh, prior to the pandemic, we saw firms moving towards technology at an accelerated rate but the pandemic really pushed many more firms who were not there to it. And so I think during this time, they've been able to see the benefits of streamlining many of these processes, adopting new technology, um, and providing a better client experience, and frankly, a better staff experience as well. It, uh, the adoption of technology for the audit is really driving the efficiency in the engagements. It's making jobs more profitable and it's helping the firm and the client continue to interact in a, in a beneficial and um, effective way, uh, regardless of the circumstances. Yeah, and if we think about, hey, was there a silver lining of the pandemic? I mean, if we had this conversation two years ago of can we do a virtual audit, the answer would have been, oh, probably not, probably not. And then we look back in 2020 and 2021, almost all audits, reviews, comps, whatever, were virtual. And they were done, they were done right, the client's happy, we're happy, the standards were met. We somehow did it, to your point of that acceleration, like two years ago, this never would've been possible. Like the chances of that happening would've been zero, but we did it, we all did it. All of you out there did it somehow, some way. And now we can learn from it and really take those steps and move forward and get better at it, use technology better, re-engage with the clients. So there's a lot of benefits of this disruption we were forced to go through that's that good silver lining amongst all this chaos we've endured every day. Yeah, well, like I said, it, it, it was, you said it wasn't possible. It was possible, we just didn't want to do it. We didn't want to push ourselves to do it. And uh, thankfully with things like, like Surelink and, and other um, solutions that are out there, it, it made it pretty easily. Thankfully, my firm uh, that I was with was an early adopter of Surelink. We used it since, uh, I don't know, 2015, somewhere in there, and so, our, our process and our move related to that, that was already set. Most of our clients already used Surelink. Um, so some of that was pretty seamless and it wasn't that big of a deal to, to make that transition to, to remote. Yeah, I'd, I would add, I was speaking with a CIO at a top 200 firm who has really been tech forward for many years. And he said they were able to transition the entire firm remote within 48 hours. Um, and it was because they already had the framework in place. Um, so they had the tools in place, and instead of scrambling to put those together at the last moment, uh, they were able to transition, focus on the clients, and also think about uh, really what, what they could help do to help the existing clients, but what they could help do to help you know, potential clients as well who were also in you know, a new scenario. Oh, that's a really good point. So there's kind of a trickle down effect of this, you know, not just doing your own job, but helping your clients figure out what was happening with their, their work. And that was a reoccurring theme we saw, like you mentioned, some firms were ready, they weren't like there yet and doing it, but they had the technology, they were able to shift overnight. Where those firms that didn't, their disruption was tremendous and they really struggled and they couldn't do it, they couldn't go home and work. They had to invest in technology like immediately to make that pivot. It was so much harder for them where those ones were ready, they wouldn't have done it on their own, but since they had the technology, it was an easy just, okay, we're gonna just switch over and we can do this. And that's a good sign. We all learn from that, that we can do these things, because like you said, like, we thought it was impossible, but we could really do it. Now, how do we learn from it and get better? And you talked about like that challenge to like, not be there talking to the client and like tapping on their door a couple of hours a day. Like, mm -hmm. how do you get stuff from the client now more virtually instead of just being there through annoyance. Like if annoyance is our only tool, how do we find a better tool than just annoyance to get something done? Yep. 
So I think this is a good time to pause. So we're going to be asking several poll questions throughout, as Gail mentioned, throughout today and tomorrow. These are not CLE, uh, CPE questions, but they're rather just to get a feel for what the audience is and, and, and um, what kind of things they've been doing so that, the, that our panelists here can relate to them. So we're going to launch our first poll question. And um, again, these are multiple choice. You can only pick one answer. Uh, the question is, how is your firm doing audits, reviews, and compilations? The options are, uh, we're doing them all on site, uh, we're doing them all remotely, we're doing a hybrid mix of on site and remote, or we just don't do this type of work. So we'll give you a, a, few, a few seconds to um, answer that, and we'll, uh, we'll share the results with the audience. That sounds great. And while we're waiting for that, um, Garrett, you specifically used the word benefits when you were talking about the fact that we've changed to so much of a concept of remote audits. So what kind of benefits are there from auditing remotely? You know, the benefit is that a lot of times we were just in the client's office, kind of distracted. We didn't have our full technology. You know, back in the day, like you mentioned, it was okay. At first, it was like we bring a huge computer, and then we bring a laptop, and then we bring like a, a big second monitor. I remember my first job; there was like a huge like case that had like a, a full size second monitor, a printer, and a scanner. So much stuff, and then it like it was always changing because we we're always trying to recreate. Like you know, now we're always used to two, three monitors. We got everything. We're trying to recreate that to just have that natively. Just makes us when we do our work so much more efficient. Yeah, we're not there. I can't see the client like this, but when I'm doing my actual job, I'm so much more efficient because I have the technology I need. I'm not trying to recreate it, like you said, Chris. Like the files, the scanners, the printers, mm -hmm. the monitors, all this stuff. Just having it there makes you better at your job because you have what you need to do it natively. And obviously you're saving on travel time. Uh, you know, a lot of CPA firms still bill by the hour. So those hours in the car traveling or on the plane, uh, you know, plus those travel costs and hotels and those things. So obviously that's a, a benefit for the firm of not having that expense. Um, on the other hand, what is it doing to our relationships with our clients? Is it are you having really good communication with your clients to where through all of this you've built a better relationship and they're even stickier to you? Or has this remote taken away that uh, face time altogether to where you may just be another accountant to them or another CPA? And, and I think that's where uh, we have to be really intentional in this, in this landscape of making sure we have time with our clients to where we're building the relationship and the connection uh, so that they are satisfied with our work and, and with our relationship. Yeah, let's, let's continue on that thought for just a minute. But first, before we do, we're going to put on the bottom of the screen the first CPE code for this session. We'll leave that up there for you know 15 seconds or so. Be sure to write down this code if you're planning on collecting CPE credit for this session. And there will be two more coming later in the session. Um, and do we have poll results yet? It looks like. Uh People are filling in a form and still voting, so I'll get back to you on that. Okay, that sounds great. It's our first one of the day. We've got to get people used to it. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the relationship with clients and how that's changing and, and what, how we need to pivot to make sure that the relationship is still a solid one if we're not seeing them in person and camping at their office, which is what we used to do. I, I can jump into there. Okay. Um, I think when we think about the interaction between the firm and the client, uh, traditionally, most firms, and still to this day, many are sending um, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet to communicate their document request to the client. Uh, there are a lot of issues that come from this. There's uh, inefficiencies, there's lack of visibility, and there's miscommunication. So staff oftentimes spend a lot of time chasing documents. Uh, their document request lists are out of date. Um, it's difficult during busy times of the year to keep them up to date. From a visibility perspective, partners, managers, the CFO on the client side, they have very limited visibility in the process. So oftentimes they're looking to the staff to give them an update on a job that changes quickly. Um, and then finally, from a miscommunication standpoint, the client could tell you, we've already given you this, or everything you need is in the portal. Um, there's a lot of, you know, the client either not knowing where they're at or maybe telling you things that they want you to hear. Um, but conversely, the firm occasionally can request the same document from the client multiple times. So um, 
if we really think about technology as a way to streamline this entire experience, that's where um, the correct tools can streamline the process. Um, they can eliminate the inefficiencies. They can provide visibility, and they can provide a much better communication between the firm and the client so that you are able to eliminate all these issues, provide a much better and streamlined experience, and uh, ultimately the staff and the client get the job done quicker without the breakdown of communication and with more visibility. So it's just, uh, it can be a win-win when you're adopting new technology for the process. I had that discussion uh, many times with clients of, I've asked for this item on the PPC list four or five times. Oh, we gave it to you, we gave it to you. Whereas when we when we adopted SureLink, I could, you know, I'm looking at my screen, I can see that you have it uploaded that item and they can see it. You know, everything is there listed and as soon as they upload it, it changes uh, to see that, that that request has been fulfilled. And so that cut down on a lot of that back and forth. So like you said, when you have the right tools, you have the right technology, uh, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, and as we look at what's the positives of all this disruption we've been through, you know, this conversation last year would have been more focused on, like, how do we just do the job? Mm. Like, the most basic level, can I actually do this? Like, I've, I haven't done any yet, or I've done a couple, like, how do I do it better? And now we're thinking through, okay, we've done it. Our clients didn't freak out. They didn't fire us. They've adapted to this. Some clients have said, yeah, you know what, Chris, don't come back. Or come back, you were there three weeks before, come back for two days. And now we're starting to think of, like you brought up, Chris, like how do we now continue to build that relationship with the client past doing the work? How do we help like the staff person, the senior, the manager, the partner, like how do they being virtual with the clients, like reach out to those people, phone, Zoom, FaceTime, Teams, whatever, and like how do you teach your staff person or your senior and your manager still build the relationship with those people with the client? And that's the next, next progression, not just how do we do the work, but how do we now like build that relationship with the client from the top down because the partner's probably still doing it the partner's just still talking to the client like you're on the client side now the partner at landmark is probably still talking to you but how do you get the people down the chain to do it and that's that fun progression like we're making change we're getting better we're improving big thing we're not going to go back and be like hey we're going to go all the way back to paper files and on site for three weeks we can find a middle ground but we can make improvements along the way yeah, still figuring out how to connect with your client. That's I was I was known as like a relationship builder with the client. You know, at Landmark, of that was my favorite part was going in, being with the client, learning about their family, their kids, whatever they had going on. Whereas now that that's been taken away unless you're really intentional about it. It was easy when you were in the office. So like you said, uh, I love the Tom Hood quote. Don't don't do uh, things differently. Do different things. How do we figure out how to do all these things, like you said, we've done it now once uh, over the last 18 months, so now how do we review that again and say, okay, what different things can we do to remain keeping that contact, keeping that connection with our client from the top down, like you yeah, said. and if you're using good technology, you can streamline those things. You can make that document exchange easier, so now you can call your client and not just be like, hey, here's my PVC list, let's go through like any of these things. You can be like, hey, client, like, how's your life going? Yeah. Like, what's going on with your hobbies, your passions? Like. How's the singing going? How the kids? How the family? Yeah. Like, you could have more of those conversations build the relationship, and less just like, let's go through the list again. Like, okay, number one, yeah. two, three, four. Valuable business conversations, valuable com conversations that actually add value, uh, not just the A and A work. Precisely, you're eliminating the issue conversations and focusing on the client, their needs, and developing the relationship. And I do think that with technology. Um, if you're really focused on finding the right time to connect with the client, you can still be making those calls, even if they had to be by Zoom. But now that most firms are moving into a hybrid environment, it's more likely that they can start to meet with the client more often again as well. So is this going to result in accounting firms? We've talked a lot about companies having to downsize because they're letting their staff be more remote from home, but actually, well, accounting firms who do audits or a lot of what used to be a lot of field work, work are they actually going to need more office space? Because now you can kind of do it from the office, right? So maybe instead of a file drawer, your staff's going to need a desk? <laughs> Is that a thing? I mean, you know, luckily now since we can work from home, we've seen that displace it. But we are starting to see just that, like, rethinking, like, what does the office look like as you have less people there? 
And especially, you look at, like, especially large firms 10, 15 years ago, so much space was the physical file room. I remember my first several firms I worked at, I mean, huge, huge rooms of just files, audit tax files just taking up shelves upon shelves that are now just like, now the firm's like, oh, yeah, that's just empty space. Like, we, you know, we keep thinking we got to do something with it. What do you do? What do those spaces look like? Do the firm space become more just like transitionary like workspaces because you don't know who's going to be there and when and you're just going to like come in and you just need a desk and you plug your laptop in and you work and it doesn't matter because you're not there that often? Um, yeah, one of our offices, uh, that's how they, they basically take in this big area and just made it a pooled area of you come in and you grab a desk. Nobody has you know a specific spot anymore uh, trying to downsize some of the, again, benefits of, of cutting cost, of cutting some of that office space. Um, I do think in this in this remote auditing world of of working in those pooled areas or working from home, our staff have to be much more intentional about being efficient and effective. That was one of the things that if I was out at a client's office for a week and a half, I could be out there with my staff, disconnect from other jobs as, as much as possible, turn off my email for a few hours and really focus on reviewing these work papers. Whereas now if you're in the office, you're at home, it's a lot easier to jump from one thing to the next to the next and you, you look up and it's been a day and you really haven't gotten anything done because you jumped between 10 different clients. Mm -hmm. So intentionality of being focused on you know, blocking time off or working on uh, specific projects, that's something that, uh, especially that lower level staff who hasn't been around the block for a while, that's something that, that they need to really focus on and be intentional about. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot of focus from the managers to know what the staff are up to, um, how they're spending their time, and just making sure they're efficient with it. Um, and that goes back to finding the right tools that allow you to track how they're spending their time so that you have visibility into those processes. Because the, the vast majority of firms that I'm speaking with right now, they're operating in a hybrid environment. Um, it's state by state. You know, there's some states are more open than others, but the vast majority of firms are still uh, looking to operate in the hybrid environment. I was speaking with a large firm out of Atlanta yesterday, and they said uh, one of their uh, staff who's been with them several years, they really like him, he decided he wanted to move back to Alaska. So they're working with him. Uh, they actually said it's kind of fun having him, or it's, it's, it's useful having him working uh, some different hours as well for different reasons. But uh, you know, firms are obviously making it work with the remote environment with the staff because frankly, they're just trying to uh, retain staff um, as much as possible right now. Yeah, and we spent a lot of time working with firms on like moving away from this goal of just like, hey, it's an audit before, you need to bill 40, 50, 60 hours in a week, and now setting, okay, like for everyone on the team, here's what needs to get done this week. So you're gonna have more distractions than before, but you gotta make it much more clear, okay, staff, one, two, senior manager, here's what needs to be done this week. And we're gonna touch base Wednesday. Monday we set the goal, Wednesday we touch base, Friday we, we want it to be done. And you've got that flexibility and that autonomy to work on it a little more freedom than you did before, but focus more on like, this is what needs to get done than just like, you need to build this many hours in a week. Because we all know, we can all fill the time, we can all bill hours, mm -hmm. especially in an audit client, it's easy. Why build eight hours a day? What would you do? Well, I was, that was the client for eight hours, like check versus like, yeah, but Friday I need to have these things done. And yeah. I need to focus on not just am I putting time in the timesheet, but am I getting something accomplished? And that's one of those shifts. It's one of those shifts past like, oh my God, how do we just do this? We're in this crazy panic, kind of like this last year. Like we're gonna do this virtually. Like we're all not gonna be here, let's make it work. Now we're back here, we're talking about how do we do it better and thinking about those things. So it's, it's great stuff for all of us. We were forced to change like never before imagined. And now we get to go from this new leapfrog spot and get better at it. Yeah, and the staff want that flexibility and they want those expectations of this is what, what you need to have done, but they want that flexibility. If we're gonna keep and retain staff, we have to, to give that flexibility of, of you're working at home and, and here's what you need to get done. And uh, if, if we force them to come back in the office, you know, you've got folks jumping all over the place. Yeah, and, and one thing to note about the staff is we're talking usually about millennials and Gen Z. These are individuals who are used to using top technology in their daily lives. Um, and so really think about when they come into the firm, what's the technology that they're greeted with to interact mm -hmm. with the client for eight hours a day? Is it something new that fits the process or is it something old 
that, per, that uh, presents a lot of difficulties for them and the client. Because uh, if you want, just like you want to retain the client, if you want to retain staff, give them a tool that really helps them be more efficient, communicate more easily, and get the job done quicker. Yeah, and that's something we've seen that's a huge change technology. In the past, the technology in the workplace was always better at home, and we've seen that flip completely in the past five years. We had technology at home in your personal life is way better than in most workplaces, and it causes that disruption. I mean, I still remember my first job interview in an accounting firm, the partner being like, yeah, and he was all proud, like, you'll have your own computer. And I was like, <laughs> it was like, you know, 2005, I'm like, why wouldn't I have my own computer? Yeah. Like, well, what do you mean? Like, I remember being, just being shocked by his, like, being so proud as a 65-year-old that, like, I'd have my own computer, which to him was probably, like, a big deal. Yeah. But to me, being, like, 21 was just kind of like... That's, that's table stakes. Yeah, I've had my own computer since I was a teenager. Like, why wouldn't I have a computer now going into, like, an office? Like, so, yeah, you got to have that technology there to engage those, especially the younger staff, because they're used to it. And you got to make that like, this, you know, realization of yourself for the older people that they have different expectations than you. Most definitely. And neither one's good or bad, but you got to recognize that there's different expectations and yours aren't going to be the same as them. Well, the client also, I think, these days has different expectations as well. They're interacting with other professionals and other companies, and I think uh, they've been pushed remote, so they've definitely most likely been looking for technology that helps them with their processes. So uh, you, you really need to be thinking about the staff and the client at the same time, and so that's something you want to look for is a solution that helps both of them and uh, provides a good experience for both. Yeah, and with that, even though we're asking them to do things differently, we're not the most forward-looking person they work with still. Mm -hmm. Even as we're asking them to go forward, we're still like behind everybody else, which is a good spot to be in, because we're not trying to say, hey, we want you to do something so forward-thinking, you've never done this before and you can't imagine it. We're just saying, hey, you know you interact with everybody else? Yeah, yeah, virtually, right, with, with portals and the cloud and web, yeah, we want you to do that with us. Okay, yeah, I can do that. It's a very easy conversation versus being like, yeah, we're going to use artificial intelligence and, and, and blockchain and all this, like, the most high-tech stuff in the world. The client's going to be like, uh, Definitely. And I, are you I, sure? I think it comes down to the introduction as well. If you introduce it to the client as something that's really going to help them and save them some time and make it easier for them, they can see the benefit right away. Um, and so that's, that's a great way to help them. And then once you go through an engagement with them and you receive the positive feedback, what I've seen a lot of firms start to do is, use these tools in their proposal process. Mm -hmm. When they realize that they're saving time and providing a better experience and the clients really like it, they then start to use it proactively um, it, from a business development perspective because they see that uh, they have something that clients are reacting to positively and competitors don't have it. So I have a question about this, but before I ask that, I, I do want to say we're getting a lot of questions about a few people were having problems with the polling software. So we're not going to ask any more polls during this session. We're going to test it during the break, and then we'll give you some more specific instructions on how to answer those So for those who um, were having trouble. So this is going to be a theme throughout the, the next two days is I liked your, your, tech, your term, the tech forward. Like most of our panelists are pretty tech forward. We've been doing this for, you know, eight years here or more, and they they, 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 they're ahead, they're leading the way. And a lot of the questions that our audience is going to have is, how do you have those, you know, you say, we, we need to educate our clients that this is important. We need to educate the older, and it's not always the older guys. Some of the older guys are very tech forward, but we need to educate those people. So what is this? Is this an individual conversation? Is this hand holding? What can you say to them? And then on the flip side, at what point do you say, these guys are just not, they're dinosaurs, they're not willing to move forward, and I don't want them as a client or as an employee? Yeah, so kind of two separate pieces. One is how do we communicate it? And then if they won't get on board, what do we do? So on the second one, if they won't get on board, that's that question we've been talking about for years and years with any firm of any size you know, what's your ideal focus? And there's some sessions on like finding your niche of like, here's what we do, here's how we operate, and if you don't fit that mold, maybe you're not the right fit. So some that won't get on board, that want everything, you know, like, they're like, no, I'm not gonna use Surelink or any software. Like, you can come on site and there'll be a huge box or 30 boxes with paper. Maybe that's not the right client for you. And then how to communicate with them, just, I think like Joe was saying, like focus for your client, how it's gonna help them. You know, they don't wanna hear how this is gonna make your life easier how this is going to make Chris Brown's life easier to have 
Sherlink or whatever solution, like here's how you can help them do their job. Because for most clients, an audit is nothing more realistically, <laughs> as he's laughing already, it's an inconvenience. Yeah. Like no one's excited to get an audit. No clients are like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Like this is gonna make my company. It's something they have to do. Yeah. They're not excited about how can you make that pain point for them easier and, and really focus on that. I'm sure that's what you see when you help firms as well. Focus on how you make it easier for the client. Exactly. So we provide some basic uh, information for the firm to provide to the client. It makes it really easy for the client to understand that really once they've set up a username and password, they just log in and they see the requests on their screen and they just drag and drop onto them. So we really focused on the client experience and how easy we could make it for them to provide documents to the firm. Um, so they just drag and drop and then automatically requests are fulfilled. So they update live, the firm is then notified and they can accept or return the request. And if there's an issue, they can communicate directly back to the client. And so we've really streamlined the entire process so that it actually be has become easier for the client. Um, and it's really easy for the firm to communicate this to the client as well. And Chris, I'm just, I'm curious, when you were introducing something like Sherlink to the client, was it as easy as I just mentioned or? Yeah, I mean, we, I create, when we got on Sherlink, I basically created a template email to send out to the clients with, you know, a little snip here of this is what it looks like, here's what you'll do, give me a call, you know, I'll, I'll call you and check up in a couple of days and see how it's gone. But uh, it didn't take a lot of instruction to, to get the clients on there. But, and, and now as, as a first year client, uh, you know, the first time I saw it from the client side, I was like, oh, yeah, this basically looks the same from both sides. It's still uh, very easy to use. And I was able to go back uh, on, on say the 401k audit that I'd never been involved with on the uh, firm side and, and go back to last year and see all the things that had been dropped in there. Okay, that's what I need to recreate. That's what I need to find. And so just user friendly was, was great. And then to Garrett's point, as the first year client, like you said, my, my outlook of the importance of the audit has changed a lot from <laughs> going from the auditor to now the client. It, uh, yeah, it, it, like you said, inconvenience maybe, yeah. but uh, not as important maybe as I thought it was at one time. <laughs> and we wanna hear more about that too. But we're gonna take a really quick break, first of all. We have a, um, a commercial break from our sponsor, Sherlink. And when we come back from that brief commercial, we're going to show you the second CPE code for this session. So we'll be back in just a minute. We've all been there. You're ready to start a tax audit or advisory engagement, and you need to request documents from a client or team member. In the past, you'd have to set up cumbersome spreadsheets to track these documents and request lists, and waste time trying to keep them current. If you did manage to keep all the dozens of documents organized, there's still the issue of sending them back and forth. Your options were either a portal where everything is jumbled together or email, which is insecure and where documents can get lost. With spreadsheets and emails or even standard document portals, it's virtually impossible for managers to understand the progress of the engagement to ensure everyone involved is looking at the same thing in real time and that everyone knows the status of requests, what they're responsible for, and all actions are logged. But with Surelink, businesses are finding an easy, secure way to request, share, and track documents. First, Surelink helps you organize your requests. You can create lists and sublists so documents stay organized and set timelines for completion so engagements stay on track. These lists and sublists are dynamic, which means they update automatically as tasks are completed. This makes it easy for anyone involved in the engagement to understand where it's at and what still needs to be done. Next, you invite users. You can add team members and clients to projects so they know what documents to provide and when. And you can lock requests so only assigned team members can access them, ensuring private information like salaries or financials stay private. Once they have been invited to an engagement, your clients can easily transfer any type of document of any size by dragging and dropping, and every action is automatically recorded. So you have a clean paper trail that provides accountability for your team and your clients. Finally, anyone from staff to managers can get real-time updates and follow the progress of requests, all while communicating with clients through integrated chat. With enterprise banking level security and easy to use user interface, 
and unlimited storage. SureLink gives you everything you need to quickly and efficiently manage your document and approve a workflow process. SureLink, a better way to work. Welcome back. We would like to put the second CPE code on the screen right now, so it should appear on the bottom. You're going to want to write this code down if you plan on collecting CPE for this session. Um, there will be one more code before we end the session, so there are three codes that you keep track of for CPE. Um, and we would like to get back to the conversation. We're going to start, but Chris had just uh, whetted our appetites with information about what it's like to flip from being an auditor to, to being audited, and that's sort of a, an experience a lot of people on the audit side really don't have. What, so what's that personal experience like when suddenly you're the client? Yeah, well, I've only gone through it once, and <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a blur. But, uh, we went through a software transition right at year end seven one, and then started the audit and, and closing the year and getting ready for board. So it was it was a, a blur of a, a month and a half there. But uh, thankfully, had a great audit team, which I can say that because I trained most of them. You know, they <laughs> they kind of took took my spot. Um, but it was definitely I could see even even me knowing that these requests or these questions, I knew the purpose behind them. There was a couple of times I even felt like a little nervous. I was like, well, why are they asking this? And, and obviously I was only there for part of the year. So I was like, oh, I don't, you know, I could play that game of like, oh, that was the previous guy. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. You'll have to ask somebody else. But uh, I can see why clients would get, got nervous, you know, when we would ask these questions of you're being audited and you feel like, you know, they're looking for things, even though I knew that that's not what, what exactly they were doing. They were just trying to get the work done and get through their sections and document the way they needed to document. But it was definitely an interesting shift of uh, this, is, this is a little different feel. But I could say that uh, thankfully the process went great. We didn't have any findings or anything like that, but uh, it, was, it was an interesting transition. So one similar story to that, uh, our CEO, Tim Ballantyne, my brother, uh, it was when he transitioned from being an auditor to the client side in industry that really made him realize the issues with the PVC document process. He had always been frustrated with them as an auditor, but then when he was on the client side, receiving the PVC list um, in Excel, having to start tracking those manually, that's really what spurred him to want to create a solution for the process. So um, just thought that would tie in yeah, well. That's awesome. Yeah. So Alexandra, have we gotten some questions from the audience? We did. We've gotten several that kind of all overlap. So I'm just going to kind of throw out this huge bunch of questions. But they want to know, um, can we talk about new ways to schedule audits? Um, communicating with clients, I think we've pretty much gotten a time of that. Um, handling documents, and then also managing time. That's a lot. So whichever one of those you guys want to focus on first, uh, I'll have at it. You know, we can start with just the first one there, like new ways to schedule audits. You know, part of it is that, okay, if that realization is we're not going to be on site anymore, as a firm, you've got to decide, are you then going to kind of stick to the old model of you're going to block off a week of someone's time to just do this one audit, and you want them to focus on that, or you go a little bit more hybrid of, okay, I'm going to schedule you now for two audits in a week and block it off. And that's something we're still like, there's no right or wrong answer because it's all so new. We're still feeling out what do you believe is going to work best for your firm and your team? Mm -hmm. You think you still need to focus on just, okay, Chris, your team is just doing this audit for this time period and that's it? And you give maybe the flexibility that they, if they get close to the end, you know, Chris, you're in charge of this audit. You can peel off these people and say, okay, they're done they can now go to their next assignments. You know, that's all a new, different part for us. But otherwise, most firms that we work with are still scheduling very much like they scheduled pre-pandemic of just like, here's when the audit occurs, here's the team, their schedule's blocked off. We're not seeing many firms jump into something totally different of a very much more hybrid scheduling approach. Yeah. I don't think there's probably many firms that are even thinking about that or discussing yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> You had mentioned something before we came on earlier of this morning of a firm that you had talked to who was, you know, how we pull tax returns. You know, you have the, the shelf out there where all the tax returns are, and, and any staff can go out there and pull a tax return on the tax side. And you're talking about a firm that's looking at doing that on the audit side of here's a pool of work, and they can just go pull, which seems, yeah, that kind of blew my mind for a minute. I was like, I 
that'd be a lot of extra documentation of adding all these people that maybe touched the audit. But uh, so uh, it's it's neat that firms are again looking at doing different things. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think there's probably a lot of firms that are thinking that far ahead. Yeah, the point that they had made was they were adding additional people to engagements so that they would be notified immediately when, immediately when document requests came in, and then the first available staff could quickly uh, go to the request, look at it, accept it or return it, and just push the engagement forward quicker. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was their view of it and kind of how they were handling that scenario. And I think uh, on the time management side, you're in a situation where it used to be you would go camp at the client's office mm -hmm. for a week and you might have downtime and all, but your focus is just on that client. If you can now juggle half a dozen audits at once and, and constantly be working and doing the different pieces of the audits, it seems like that's a win-win, except does it get complicated? Yeah, well, the, the, you know, the managers are already doing that. They're out in the field and they're juggling half a dozen or more audits. But yeah, those staff folks who, they look at the schedule, like you said, and they said, this week is this client, and that's really all they uh, care about unless they have, you know, which happens a lot. You had the, the audit from the week before that still isn't wrapped up and you're getting emails from that senior or that manager saying, I need you to, when you have time, hit that. So. There's some of that, it just has to be ramped up. And, but at the same time, like I said earlier, you have to be intentional about making sure you're focused and blocked on those things that you're not just jumping all day long and not really accomplishing anything. Yeah, and that can be that shift to work with your staff people to say, because we all remember being a staff accountant on audits. There was a lot of downtime because like you're the last landing man on the totem pole and if there's a manager, they're trying to oversee three or four other people, their own work, partner multiple other jobs, mm -hmm and they can't like help the three staff people like right away. So you got some downtime. So it's more of a firm decision. Like, do you want to tell that staff person you're now on, to your point, Gail, four audits this week to better fill your calendar? But if you do that, you now need to better help manage that new staff and provide them some more direction on like, here are your goals and objectives. Here's what needs to get done. If there's a problem, here's what you do. And here's how often someone's gonna, that manager's gonna check in with you to make sure we hit those objectives. Because otherwise, you go from them having a ton of extra time, which isn't just wasted time, which isn't good, to giving them like six audits, and you create a whole different problem. So we just gotta watch that pendulum swinging the other way, and Chris used the word intentionality a lot. If you're gonna do that, you gotta be intentional in how you're gonna structure that, how you oversee them, how you're gonna assign the work, and really spend a lot more time up front thinking through, okay, for these three staff people, what work do I give them? How many audits? What's the check-in process? What's the follow-up process? There's a lot to it. It can work, but we can't just throw it out there. Here you go, Chris, take six audits as a staff person, like, go. It's gonna be a train wreck, and they're gonna sit back, typical firm thing, and be like, this didn't work, this was a waste. Like, we're going back on site. Yeah. You're like, well, <laughs> the on-site or not wasn't the problem. Like, yeah. the problem was you gave the, audit, the staff accountant six audits in a week, and just tell them to go at it, and yeah. guess what? Nothing got done. And a lot of these discussions that we're talking about, it's how are you the partner or uh, the manager, how much time are you spending in the, the practice versus how much time are you spending on the practice? These are discussions that need to be taking place, but because of the never-ending tax season of the last 18 months with, with the pandemic and PPP and all these other things, I think the, the, the partners and the, and the people are just drowning. And it's like they don't have time to think through these things because they're, they're spending so much time in the business that they're not getting to spend any time on the business of strategic planning and thinking. And so that would be the question I would ask this morning of how much time are you spending on the business versus in the business? And you need to, to set some block time to, to think through these questions and what kind of firm do we want to be and spending more time uh, on the business than just in there doing the work. Yeah, Chris, I just actually, I've been hearing that from more and more firms as they kind of get out of the pandemic of they've been in this just like, try, how do I get through every single day mode? Yeah. And they've really put a lot of that long-term planning even more on the back burner, and they're starting to feel that pain more and more. And I just wrote about this for practice advice, like, yeah, because what happened? We had that choice. Do I focus every day on the chaos, or do I still block off time to plan for the future? And we all kind of said, chaos, I gotta get through today. Yeah. What do we stop doing? We plan, stop planning for the future, and now we're paying a little bit of that price, and we gotta swing it back a little bit more of, okay, let's take some time. How do I plan for this? How do I schedule these audits? How am I gonna make them work now in a virtual or hybrid world? 
allocate my resources, leverage technology, how am I gonna use the rest of December to think about how am I gonna do all these things instead of just like, I'll wait till like March, February and be like, oh yeah, we're back again. Like, oh yeah, I saw, I saw a thing for Surelink back in December, like it's March 15th and this is a pain. Can I use that now? And you're like, it's too late, like you missed the boat. It's a great time to reassess your technology stack. Like every firm should be doing that at this point um, and really thinking about what they've learned through the pandemic, what were their issues, whether with staff, with clients, was it scheduling, was it billing, uh, was it client inter interaction? Um, so reassess the tech stack um, and start to make some strategic decisions before uh, you continue just to stay behind the curve. Um, I wanna just have our third CPE code posted on the screen right now. So uh, if you're keeping track of codes for CPE credit, be sure to write down this three digit code. This is the third code for this session. Um, also, I've got a question that came in from the audience that I think uh, is pretty relevant to this whole topic, which is how do you compensate for the ability to spot possible problem areas that you used to spot while you were in the field? It seems like relying on verbal assurances isn't quite enough. So, and Garrett, I know you wanted to talk about risk and issues, so I think you should start with this. Yeah, I mean, one of those things like, you know, that common misconception of like, how much is an audit supposed to detect fraud anyways? You know, the standards say we need to remain professionally skeptical and aware of what's going on, but our goal is not to suspect fraud. And yeah, just like before, if you're asking some a question, you need to listen to their answer, you know, you can verify it through some looking at documents, use our judgment. If you feel like there's a problem, whether you're in person or virtual, or you think the client is being dishonest to you, you know, frankly, in my experience from the firms I've worked with in my own career, that's pretty rare. Like that's a pretty like high standard and not many firms have been through it. If you have, there's sure to be a red flag going off of like, this is the problem, we need to document this and we need to consider the ramifications and maybe we disengage from this client. Yeah. Like if you have a situation where you're worried that your client is lying to you on an audit, you probably, there's probably a bigger risk than that because you're probably already looking past other things. That's a, that's a rare, rare statement do I hear from firms ever like, I'm worried my audit client is lying to me. Yeah. But we do need to beef up that risk assessment as far as making sure we're asking those questions of, of what changed in their controls when they maybe all went home. Are mm -hmm. things getting reviewed? Are things getting two people looking at them? Or was it, again, kind of like in our business, we're just trying to survive and they were just yeah. doing everything they could to survive and, and those controls went away, making sure we have a, a maybe a separate risk assessment for what happened during that time period. and. Uh, but that, that is important to make sure we're, we're updating our risk assessment and not just rolling it forward, Sally, and, and moving on. So what else um, do we wanna make sure we cover before we, we approach the close of this session about what we're looking for in the way of change in audits and, and what do we kind of see? What's our crystal balls? How, how are audits gonna look in the future? Is there a push among firms to can we just get back to the old days? Can we get back to normal and have people out in the field and do what we used to do? Um, are we gonna stick in a hybrid area? Or wh what do you guys see as the future of audits and in particular remote audits? I don't see the, I don't see it going back to the way it was. I think the staff enjoy the flexibility. They enjoy uh, being remote. I think, um, I think we can get more work done that way. And so I see that hybrid. I see the need for that face-to-face -face with your client to build those relationships. But like Garrett said, it may not be being out there in front of them for two weeks so that they know you're working on it. It may be coming out for two or three days to do that planning, to do the risk assessment, to ask those inquiries, to do your inventory observation or, or other things like that, and then stepping back and uh, allowing the client to have some space and you to have some space to get things done. Yeah, I think we'll continue to see firms operating in a hybrid environment. Um, that's consistently what I hear from firms that they're looking to do. So I think firms just need to continue to question how they can use technology to supplement their processes, um, to provide a better client experience, to have more efficiency, get their jobs done in a better way, and uh, continue to operate that way. Yeah, I think, Gail, you can ask, like, what are audits going to look like in the future? I think the fundamental of what an audit looks like isn't gonna change quickly because the standard settings board, they're not a fast moving governing body. Like the level that we have to comply with 
is going to take forever to change. So there's be that slow progression. But no matter what, and we've talked about this forever on the audit side, like we need to be better about risk assessment. That's one of those common findings, whether it's the PCOB or non-public audits, what do we not do a good job of today, whether we're hybrid or in person? Risk assessment. Like we're really bad at that as auditors, and that's something we can push to be better at that doesn't really involve technology. It involves us sitting and thinking, doing, how do I do more planning? How do I think about where do the risk actually sit? And how can I not, for cash, do the same 20 audit steps I've always done, but what are the maybe five that matter on this client? And I'm gonna do those five really well, and I'm not gonna do these other five or 10 or 15. And really focus on that. And then, you know, if you can do the work better, like Chris said, you know, build that relationship. Spend more time building that relationship with the client, getting to know them, interacting with them, find ways to add value. All those good things, the clients can be happier. Hmm for it as a result. So there's good things coming and yeah, just just don't go back. Don't go back to full time in person at your firm, at the client, wherever it is. You made so much change, you did a great job. Embrace it and move to the future. All right, we're out of time. I would love to continue this conversation, but thank you all so much for being here. Chris and Joan Garrett, great job. Thank you to Sherlink for making this session possible and to all of our sponsors for making this event possible. Thank you all for staying with us this first session and don't go away because our next session is going to be looking at new tax legislation and how that relates to your long and short term planning for your clients. Uh, also stay here because we're just going to have another brief word from Sherlink. And we will see you at the top of the hour. You know, we're a firm that puts quality over incremental profit. And Sherlink is a product that helps us provide quality experience and a quality product. I'm Darren Leonard. I am an audit director at Tanner. We are the largest locally owned CPA firm in Utah. Before Sherlink, our document request system was very cumbersome. We had to create it from scratch. It had to go through a major review process. It was common to hear from a client that, oh, I've already given that to you because everything wasn't in a central location. And I personally, I had a client say, we love everything that you're doing for us, but uh, we, we sure would appreciate a secure transfer system. We actually just kind of stumbled onto Surelink um, and loved it from the very beginning. Uh, Surelink has really made it uh, quite easy to keep things organized, secure of course, and kind of keep track of what they've given you, what you've accepted, and what they need to look at again, rather than just trying to go through a big uh, box of receipts. It was a very easy implementation. I think that's what people are concerned with when they, ever they adopt new software is how hard will this be to implement? How hard will it be for my clients to implement this? I don't think you ever have 100% acceptance of a product, but this came as close as you can get. Tanner let me do this year-long program that's designed for working professionals. We lived in 12 different countries all over the world. Cheerlink was great anytime, day or night, because I was always working in different time zones. I could just pull up whatever the client provided, not have to bug them or wait till it was 8 a.m. in Utah so that I could get working and Portugal or wherever I was. As far as recommending Sherlink, of course, there's no better way to track client files in an audit or taxes or whatever you might be doing. It's a secure way, it's organized, and clients love it.